Hello, friends, and welcome back to the Internet Writing Buddies podcast, brought to you by Grace and me. I'm the dork in the road, and with me, and always, is the illustrious Grace. Yes, the illustrious Grace, a.k.a. the Graceful Renegade, is with Ben today. How are you, Ben? Uh, you know, I'm okay, but I'm not as good as some people I know who are looking very tan and well-rested after uh, partying like a rock star in the last <laughs> week. Do you want to... Do you want to just make everyone mad at you, as mad at you as I am, by telling us about the trip you just got back from? Yeah, just as a prerequisite, um, I'm spoiled rotten and got very lucky to be invited on a very, uh, I don't even know how to put this, bougie, bougie. weekend. Bougie um, I got invited to fly on a private jet down to Baja for a couple of days, hang out on a yacht, go fishing, and then fly home. Uh, these are some friends of friends that had some extra room on a jet. Uh, I enjoyed my Taylor Swift best life all weekend, drank way too much tequila, got a nice tan, and am definitely well rested. So, yeah, I would definitely say that uh, I'm in a great mood today, and I am very, very happy that I got to escape last weekend. So, sorry again to everybody to anger you. I know a lot of people are in the deep, dark trenches of winter, but. It was worth it. When you're so rich that not only do you have a jet, but you have a jet with extra room to bring randos. And yeah, the weather here sucked while you were gone, by the way. So I know. I was actually watching that over the weekend, and I was like, this could not be a better time to escape. Also, bring friends that are nice to look at. I would like to think I am nice to look at. So therefore, occasionally I get invited to go do things because I am a nice, um, I guess, uh, asset to a trip like that i also am not terrible to talk to yeah also literal asset there's a reason why i do a lot of squats in the gym but anyway <laughs> yeah meanwhile i was snow camping uh <laughs> and yep. eating campfire chili which was delicious by the way in my forerunner with my dog so you know i had fun too it's basically the same it's basically the same thing basically i mean you've same. got a nice little tint going on too yeah, it's uh, burn myself on the campfire getting too close to the chili. <laughs> Happens to the best of us. Yeah, that was fun. That was a, so we both had good weekends in equally entertaining and um, cost effective ways. Absolutely, you probably Very spent less than I did, actually. <laughs> uh. Anyway, I don't want to talk about that anymore because it makes me sad. But today, what we are going to talk about is, I think, a topic that. And you know, and I'm speaking from personal experience here, can be intimidating to yes. people getting into motorcycling, not just dual sport and adventure, but but all types of motorcycling. Uh, and that is mechanican, or as I like to call it, motorcycle maintenance for morons. Um, yes. which is me. I'm calling myself a moron, not all of you, but I think it's interesting because and you can chime in on this. Let me know if this is what you see. But I see two groups of people. I see people that grew up working on engines and cars. It's sort of like dirt bike. It's like riding in general. Like right. Some people grew up riding. Some people didn't. You know, yeah. If you grew up you know, under the hood with your dad or your uncle or your mom or whatever working on cars and you, know, you just have this sort of innate familiarity and confidence when it comes to mechanical things, things seem easy. This is the stuff that I would be like, oh, I'm not sure about how to do And people would chime in with like, what are you talking about? Stupid easy. And yeah. it's like, eh, for you. But there's the yeah. other the other camp, which is people that maybe didn't grow up doing that and are learning these basic skills from scratch and are prone, in my case, to making stupid mistakes like stripping bolts or losing washers. In fact, the cruise control on my Transalp is, it moves because I lost the little nut out of the back that you tighten it down and I don't know where it went. It's on the floor in my garage somewhere. So it doesn't move too badly. So I just left it. But stuff like that happens to me every time. So... What, yeah. what about you? What is your experience with mechanic? And I would also argue there's a third category Ooh, of person of which third. I am a part of, which is someone who can pretty much change the oil and make very, very minor adjustments on their motorcycles. And that is about it. I am not mechanically inclined. I'm not ever going to pretend that I am. I can always help and assist and do little things here and there. But uh, I didn't grow up doing it. And most of the time, I trust a professional to do it more than I trust myself because if I fuck something up and it comes back to bite me in the ass when I'm out riding one day, I'm going to be pretty upset. So I actually am very lucky that 
apparently, just like I did for the weekend, I make friends in the right places. And one of my best guy friends is an incredible mechanic that I rely on here in Bend. And he helps me with everything. I'm usually there assisting, but I'm not even going to try and pretend like I know how the hell to do anything on a motorcycle other than change the oil because I don't. <laughs> Which is weird because you lived off one. So what the hell did you do when stuff went sideways? Um, again, there's a lovely thing, which we'll further discuss, called YouTube, in which right. I would watch instructional videos on how to fix little things, whether that was a little fork seal or whatever else. I had a broken valve on one of my tires at one point. Everything ended up being fine. But a lot of that I got resolved just by looking things up on the internet and then getting to a mechanic as quickly as I could. But no, otherwise, I don't have a lot of knowledge in that department because kind of like Ben, I didn't grow up doing it. and. As an adult, I've learned just enough to get by and survive and make sure my bike my bike gets into the shop when it needs to. That's it. That, yeah. that is the definition of adulting, learning just enough to get by and survive. So the yeah. third school is what I like to call the BMW school, which is yep. you have somebody else do all your maintenance. Pretty much. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Okay. Good. Well, um, it's so I think it's. This is good perspective. Uh, what we needed was like Nathan or somebody here that actually knows how to work on bikes for the other perspective. But we at least <laughs> have two different perspectives here in the middle. And I think even if, and it's funny hearing you say that, but you still don't go to the dealership. And I bet you don't go no. to the dealership because it's stupid expensive, right? And it's that's why one really good reason why it's important, I think, to attempt these things, even if they intimidate you, start small, obviously, like anything else, is that... The dealership, it's like a hundred bucks for an oil change, something stupid, like two quarts of oil and a freaking yeah. filter. Like it's a, when you get it down, it's a 15 minute job. Like yeah. and they're doing it faster than that. Cause they have all the equipment. So it's a total, it's a ripoff. Peace of mind is. is whatever. And I'm not, I'm not shaming people who take advantage of that, but I'm no. just saying it's not required. No. Um, and when you get in and move around and get in your bike and, you know, do oil changes and little things like that. You get to know where stuff is. Right. Um, and you notice when something's off, right? So I heard a big clang when I went over that rock and I, uh, yeah. I don't know what it is, but you look and your foot peg is crooked or, you know, one yeah. of the bolts is missing from your skid plate that you know is supposed to be there. Right. right? So there are advantages and I think people yeah. should attempt it. Absolutely. I mean, and that's not to say I do know where everything is on my bike. I will say that. Like, I know my way around a bike. I know where the parts are. I know even kind of when things go wrong, what to problem solve and look for. Again, because I spend so much time living off a bike. It's just actually fixing it that I don't enjoy doing. Also, because again, like, I haven't been actively involved mechanically for all of my life, like a lot of mechanics have. And so I'm going to trust that to somebody that knows way more than I do with the hopes it turns out well. But yeah, I think having that preliminary knowledge base is important because then you can avoid going to a dealership where you get ripped off. And that also like big thing I know we'll talk about too is cost of labor is so high right now. So there is kind of an investment opportunity you can take in educating yourself on how to fix things on the bike because over time it will save you hundreds if not thousands of dollars. Yep. And I, you raise an interesting point that I hadn't considered because you talked about repairs. And and I think repairs are a, a whole nother level of hell beyond maintenance, yeah. right? Maintenance is yeah. taking one thing on and putting it back on. Repairs is like, this is broken. I have to die. So, and I, I in general, at least today, we're not talking about repairs. We're going to talk about maintenance, maintenance tasks, things that have to happen in order to keep your motorcycle running right. Um, and that will continue to like a repair could be a one-off, right? You only break your axle once or whatever, but you got to change your oil every, every year or whatever. So yeah. it's worth, again, that investment pays dividends over time because yeah. you can keep doing it. And once you learn to do it on one bike, you can kind of do it on all of them. So, right. um, but it can feel intimidating. I remember when I started, when I've got my first bike, I was terrified to do anything to it because it, you just spent all this money on yep. a very expensive item. That's very complicated seeming and uh, you know you're afraid that if you screw something up you're going to either damage the bike or it's going to be a costly repair that right. is going to cost way more than if you just taken it in in the first place um i can say it now that i'm a little more experienced i think some of those fears were a little over paranoid but just because having gotten myself out of situations that i thought were disastrous um it hasn't cost as much or been as difficult as i thought but i guess my biggest point is what we want to talk about today is easy-ish maintenance tasks that even mechanical morons can do. We're really leaning into the alliteration today. Um, and 
and I think Grace and I have unique perspective because we're both mechanical morons. So if yeah. we can do it, if we can, yeah. these are everything we're going to talk about today is stuff that I have done and continue to do for myself. If we can do it, you can do it. Absolutely. Now, there's yeah. resources that will help you ease in, but I think you can do it. Yeah. Agreed. And obvious, sorry, go ahead. No, I was just going to say, and honestly, most of the things that we're going to talk about today are things that I have done in passing. It's just that I actively choose as an adult now for the majority of the time to not do them, which you can, by the way, you know, absolutely. If you trust somebody else to do it for you, great, do it. Uh, but they are little things, like Ben said, that you can do in your garage, in your driveway that just make life a little bit easier and save you some money in the process. Yeah, which you can spend on better mods and more gas and other trips. Absolutely. And I, you know, and I'm lucky you, you, raise, you raise another good point. God, you're so good at raising good points. Do my um, best. That, my job is to do motorcycle stuff. So, you know, I can go out and change my oil as part of my work day. If you are just a busy human that doesn't have time for that and you just want to ride, you have limited time to enjoy your bike and you just want to ride it. It makes sense to pay someone else to do your maintenance. But absolutely. Yeah, that's not what we're not talking about. Like you're a loser if you don't do your own maintenance. The point is, if you're if you're intimidated by it, there are some things that pretty much anybody can do with a little practice and guidance. Yes. 100%. Uh, and obvi obviously, every bike is different. Uh, some things will be easier on other bikes, on some bikes than others. But in general, these are all things we can do for our own motorcycles. And the first one I want to talk about is the one we've already been talking about, and that's oil changes. Mm -hmm. um, because they are necessary, and it depends on your bike. So like on my adventure bikes my or my dual sports with street engines, I, it's mostly a once-a-year job after the initial right. break-in. So you'll go 600 miles, change it, and then the, the intervals are all like five to 8,000 miles, and it's like – or once a year. And so I right. kind of just in June know that I'm going to change the oil on all my bikes. Um, but the dealership will charge you up the bum bum for that. And it's actually a pretty easy process. Yeah, absolutely. I think one of the big issues that most ADV riders run into more than anything else is just when you have a bike where you have to remove the skid plate to do the oil change, mainly just because it's time consuming and kind of a pain in the ass. And, you know, with both of my Hondas, it's that way. Um, so a lot of the time, you know, it just takes that kind of like hammering away, getting the skid plate off, doing the oil change, and then getting it back on. But if that's the worst thing you have to kind of deal with to do your oil change, other than learning how to do it, you're doing great. <laughs> yeah. And pro tip, some of them are like, oh, there's a there's a hole for the oil drain plug so you don't have to take it off. Uh, no. Sometimes, but rarely, because you always get oil all up in that skid plate. And then it's yeah. just nasty. So yeah. it's usually four bolts. And if you put it on yourself, which is one of the things we'll talk about is easy mods. Um, mm -hmm. Depending. I had that Turtex skid plate on my, on my T7. And oh my God, it was the worst. It was like 12 bolts. And then I had to take the whole frame off to get to the oil filter. It was a whole yeah. thing. So not, um, not all skid plates are created equal. That's no. for sure. Yeah. But I replaced it with a, a Tusk one, and that was four bolts, and it was easy. But Don't yeah, in do. general, the, actually, do you want to talk through the process of an oil change in general? Like, what are the steps? I mean, sure. First, I mean, not to put you on the spot, pop quiz you. I can talk about it if you want, but. Well, we can both talk about it, whatever you okay. want to do. I mean, okay. first step is center stand, usually, unless you have you a have lift, one. which is yeah. great. Um, both of those are highly recommended. Second, get the skid plate off. Definitely take the skid plate off, always. I mean, I agree with Ben. There's usually a little hole where you can drain the oil. Don't do that. It gets everywhere. I've done that to myself many times. Um, once you drain the oil, then you find your nice little spot to put the oil back in. And depending on your bike, how much oil are you usually, are you usually putting in yours, Ben? Whatever the owner's manual says. <laughs> yes. So that's a good point to bring up, which is every bike is different with how much oil it takes. So make sure you have your owner's manual. Um, or you can find a little something on your phone called the internet or Google, what? which will help direct you to how much oil you need. Um, there's also a big debate about synthetic versus non-synthetic. Oh, know God, that's, that's a whole topic by itself. And that's a whole topic all by itself. Um, I usually use synthetic. Ben, what do you usually use? So I'm of the opinion that as long as it says Jasso MA on it, it doesn't matter um, because the differences are minuscule. But yeah. generally, at the same time, I will do conventional for the first oil change and then swap to synthetic after that. Not because one damages your engine or whatever but because i sometimes am lazy and don't get to it as often and synthetic lasts longer yes synthetic does last longer i think but yeah i mean i think overall we could argue points back and forth forever it's not going to make that big of a difference yeah um what did i miss 
oil filter. Well, so, yeah. Yeah, you got to do your oil filter. Not every time. Um, Not depends every time. on your bike, but yeah. every other time, at least in general. I, I mm -hmm. usually just do it anyway because they're cheap, cheap insurance. Yeah. Super cheap. Yeah. And those you can get anywhere, like at any motorcycle shop or even at a dealership if you've got to stop in somewhere. They usually always have them. Just make sure you have one for the exchange. I usually put one in every time, anyway. Um, yeah. And then once you kind of drain the oil, plug it back up, fill it up. What do you do with your oil when you're done, Ben? That's a good question. I, so, and it depends on the bike because some of them you need like the exact amount, right? Mm -hmm. So, like if it's two quarts, I, I pour the two new quarts in and then I pour the old oil from the drain pan into the quarts I just used and take yeah. it to the hardware store cause or the auto parts store because they'll recycle it. Yeah. Sometimes it gets funky. And so you need, sometimes I have an extra jug around because of that. But yeah, you can recycle it. It doesn't go in the garbage. You can also put it on the curbside. But when I do that, the, the trash company charges me. So I just drive it down to the auto parts store. Um, yeah. One thing I want to talk about is drain plugs while we're talking drain about okay. because it's easy. It's probably the easiest thing to screw up on an oil change in a bunch of different ways. Like yeah. cross threading bolts is something I'm super paranoid about. And a lot of these bikes have, you know, aluminum cases or magnesium or whatever. So it's possible. So one, the drain plug should always go in easily. Like if you're yeah. fighting it, stop right now because you do not want to replace the, the case around that engine. But um, torquing your God, some people, I don't know why they feel like they need to be like a freaking gorilla reefing on those drain bolts uh, that's a good way to cause problems for yourself to wear those threads out to make it difficult to get it out later on so when i tighten actually when i tighten uh yeah drain bolts i always go tight like not tight but like snug and then i'll take a wrench no. and do a quarter turn that's it yeah no more you do not need to tighten it down so hard because you have a crush washer that'll prevent leaks so it doesn't have right. to be the tightest it just has to not come out well and i think what to to feed off of that point, this is going to be the thing you kind of like go back and forth on the most on your bike. So the last thing you want to be doing is screwing that up and wrenching around on it and twerking it in a bad way so that you have to replace everything because the gentler you are, the longer everything is going to last. I'm sorry. Did you say twerking it? You definitely twerking. meant tweaking it. <laughs> <laughs> tweaking and twerking. That was a total Freudian slip. <laughs> What were you doing this weekend? I was, I was twerking. Say, can you tell I was in Mexico this weekend? <laughs> I had a lot of tequila this weekend and I enjoyed myself. What can Grace I say? Is, Grace is twerking it. Uh, <laughs> that The worst drain plug I ever had, my 450L. And the first time I took it off, and it's stupid because it goes up. It's flat mounted, so it goes up inside the case. And it has a um, an Allen key. It's not a bolt that sticks down. So, yeah. but and I, the first time I took it off, I thought some idiot had, the guy I bought it from was a moron or something because it was oh, so no. tight. I had to use a breaker bar to get it off. But apparently, it's that design, and it's a it's a bad because people have cracked their cases trying to get Holy it off. Shit. So, yeah, it's wow. a, it's a common failure with those bikes. So interesting. Um, Takamoto makes a replacement that has an actual nut on the bottom. So that has gone on since. Um, and it, the other thing is if yeah, drain plugs are cheap to replace, but not, but engine cases aren't. So, you know, yeah, I would err on the side of, I don't, you don't want to round it off, but at least if you do, you just get a new one, and put it in. Yeah. Uh, um, gosh, something else I was going to say. Mm, so important, whatever it was, because obviously I remember it, but oh, oil filter torque, same thing as like that. I just go hand tight. I won't even put a wrench on it to tighten it. You often need one to loosen it, but yeah, um, you don't need to go crazy there. And, you know, no. little tips, like put a little oil on the. A rubber seal and whatever. And there's videos. I made a video actually on my channel about yeah. oil changes. Which, video. It's a yeah. 500X, um, but it, it's similar to any street-ish bike. The difference uh, between a dual sport and an adventure bike is an adventure bike has a filter that is on the X, is on the outside, and a dirt bike dual sport is usually on the inside. Yeah. But pretty easy. Um, yeah, yeah, oil changes. Um, yeah. I had a point, and it keeps sneaking into my brain and then leaving. Okay. Say something quick. We'll come back well, I guess uh, one point to take into everything with motorcycle maintenance and something I think about all the time is just don't over tighten anything because, oh my God, it sucks. So just be mindful of that no matter what you're doing on the bike, whether you're adding crash bars or doing your oil, just don't over tighten it because then later you're going to regret it. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. So uh, one question I get a lot when I recommend people do their oil changes is, well, what about the warranty? Mm -hmm. And uh, in general, and this is hearsay and anecdotal evidence, so it's not gospel, but in general, I believe if you're keeping receipts, 
and can prove that the maintenance was done, they'll generally honor your warranty. If you're paranoid about it, you could go to your dealership and make that purchase so that they know that you bought an oil and you bought oil and a filter there. But um, yeah. in general, I just keep records. I haven't had any many warranty claims and no one's ever asked me for it when I did. But yeah. FYI, the other thing I was going to say, I remember now is if you don't want to figure out what size crush washer and oil filter and blah, blah, blah to get the Rocky Mountain ATV has the thing where you just go in and put in your bike and they'll send you a kit with all of the rubber O-rings, crush washers, uh, filter and the exact amount of oil that you need. And you don't have to think about it. And they don't upcharge for the kit. It's just you're buying it from them. So they make money that way. So they just charge what it costs. Yeah, so absolutely. I use those a lot. Well, I guess the second easiest thing to do on the bike, which is also something I've done quite a bit of, is chain maintenance. I which hope so is super, super important so that you can keep riding and not royally screw up your bike in a bad way. Yeah, and it, I've heard people say, well, O-ring chains don't need to be maintained, and maybe technically, but I've also had O-ring chains fail, and I've, I've read or been told that um, part of chain maintenance isn't just for the chain. It also keeps your sprockets and everything from wearing right. out as fast. I mean, and you've probably seen a kinky, dried-out chain out in the middle of nowhere as many times as I have and it's just like that is that is not good. I have had a kinky dried up chain on my bike before and it's miserable because then the only thing you're thinking about for for me it was the three days of riding to get a new chain is oh my god, I hope this thing doesn't snap when I'm going seventy five miles an hour down the highway. Uh is not a good thing to have. Obviously you can put a lot of wear and tear into your chain depending on what type of chain you get. I go with X ring now, but um you know, it's just whatever, whatever you put into it, you're going to get out of it. And if you're not maintaining it, you're not going to have longevity with it at all. Right. A chain is a, is a consumable item, but you yep. know, you, if you can make it last longer between consumptions, yep. you should, uh, yes. how often do you clean your chain? This is a loaded question. That is a very loaded question. Um, not often enough ever. Uh, I don't feel like, um, I have done a very good job with the CB and, um, after that first chain went a little, uh, dry on me. Um, but I feel like I'm keeping an eye on it. I have a gauge in my head of when it starts to look like I need to be lubing it up and taking care of it and whatever else. Um, everybody's different though. Some people it's every time they ride for me, it's usually like if I'm riding a lot, it's once a week or twice a week. Um, it just depends entirely on how many miles I'm putting on the bike and also how much dirt and mud and shit I'm riding through and getting it caked up and whatever else. But how often are you cleaning yours then? Yeah. You thought I was going to shame you, but no, I just, uh, I clean it when it looks gross. Yeah. <laughs> or when I, I noticed that it has it. surface yeah. rust, like or whatever, or else, yeah. or I go like, geez, I have not cleaned that one in a while. Yeah. Try to do that. There are some people that I feel like take it a little far and are a little like, oh my God, like has to be done every time, every ride, whatever else. I don't think so. I really don't. Um, but you know, to each their own. That's just depends on the is. conditions too. Like if you're in the mud, yeah. you want to get that off there. If you're riding yeah. on the beach, you want to get that the, the salt water off it's there. The salt water. Like yeah. 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 Anything that's going to erode slowly, get it out there. Yeah. So just to. If you haven't cleaned your own chain, let's just talk about how easy it is. The the short version is the uh, you spray cleaner on your chain. Um, maybe even rinse it off if it's like really gross, nasty cake. But you spray some cleaner on it, and then you scrub it with a brush, um, mm -hmm. typically plastic brush. They make chain cleaning brushes, and then I use a toothbrush. Um, FYI, so you can use a toothbrush. It yeah, works that's just fine. All good. And then you wipe off or spray off. The cleaner, add lubricant, and um, ride. There are some steps you can take in there, like warm the chain up first, things like that, FYI. But like the basic process is that. Yeah. And I know a lot of people do this differently. It also depends on if you have a center stand or not. But I think the easiest way to do it is pop your bike in the center stand, put it, make sure it's in neutral, and just rotate the tire, get the chain completely lubed up, cleaned up, and then you're good to go. Yeah, and do not, as tempting as it might be, turn the engine on and engage the transmission because uh motocamp nerd ben was just telling me about a friend of his who chopped the end of his finger off doing that so no way really just, yeah just spin the tire with your hand and but you don't have to have a center stand 
Um, no. it's a, it's way easier and I'll do it three times as much when I do, but yeah. you can just clean the parts of the chain that are visible and roll the bike, clean those parts, right? That's totally doable. Um, another thing is you can go to Harbor Freight and they make those little floor roller things that you just pop the back wheel into, and then you can they're spin so it. Oh, nice. I yeah, don't have not expand on either of my Hondas. And so I use that pop up all the time. I got one. It's so nice to have super convenient and, you know, just makes chain cleaning a lot easier. The other thing you can do is the those moto crutches. I have one mm -hmm. where you just kind of pop it into your skid plate and your um, your side stand works as the other side of yeah. a, kind of a tripod with the front wheel and it'll keep the rear wheel off the ground so that you can do that. It's also yep. good for changing tires and stuff. So Yeah, for um, sure. Absolutely. But you definitely, chain maintenance is kind of a required thing and it's not, it would not make sense to go to the dealership for that. That's something that no. I would highly encourage you to do yourself. No, get your, get your chain switched out with somebody who knows what they're doing if you unless you are somebody who i think has done a chain swap before yeah i paid um, for my or, last one what'd you say i paid for my last chain swap like yeah um, i think unless you have experience doing it it's always good to have a professional mechanic do it but for just actual maintenance just it's so easy to do at home yeah yep no dremel required just a brush and some cleaner and, mm -hmm. you know, another long debate we could get into is what kind of chain lube do you use? But at the end of the day, as long as you have chain lube, you're doing all right. When I worked for a touring company for a little while, I won't even begin to list some of the random things that were used to save money as chain lube. <laughs> it was um, it was interesting. That's for sure. Yeah. yeah. But yeah. there are lots of different things that work in dire situations. Just know that olive right. oil being one of them. Some lube is better than no lube in a lot of situations. Always lube up, everybody. <laughs> um, anyway, we lube all of you. Uh, so another thing that's super easy to do, and it's it's similar with cars in that this is a thing yeah. that is cheap and easy, but the dealership will, and, and or the oil chain place, will uh, gladly charge you way too much, and that is air filter changes. Now, there's yep. a caveat here. Um, some bikes are easier than others. The Trans Alps yes. literally requires you to take all the fairings off. People have commented and commented on this, and it's true. It is a massive pain in the ass. The Africa yeah. Twin was no less than 15 to 18 fasteners that had to be removed because both side fairings had to come off. So it seems like the bigger and more complicated the bike, the more difficult it is. But like yeah. dual sports and dirt bikes, generally very easy. So easy on dirt bikes and dual sport bikes. Less so on ADV bikes. But I don't know. I feel like you're changing them out. I mean, depending on how much you're riding your ADV bike, like I'm on my dirt bike more. So I feel like I'm ch I've changed that one already plenty of times and it's a piece of cake, but every bike is different. Yeah. The air filter change intervals are way longer on an adventure bike. And it just yeah. depends on if you're on the street all the time. You can do that. If you're out following people in the dust a lot, you're going to have to change it more often. Yes. Agreed. Cause it, it, and it will make a difference. Like I've more than once, swapped out the air filter and been like holy crap this bike is fast yeah oh yeah sometimes so, it's gnarly yeah there's two types of filters this is the the first distinction to make there's the paper filter which is like what's in your car yeah. um and generally it's just a rubber gasket around a paper filter and you swap it knn makes filters for bikes just like they do for cars that are more permanent um that are kind of a hybrid because they use the oil and stuff like right uh, a foam filter and then like your dirt bikes and dual sports depending on the bike so like my 450l had an oiled filter. Um, the XT225 I had had a had a foam oiled filter. The, mm -hmm. uh, the KX 230 in the garage has an oiled foam filter. Yeah. But um, my th actually I don't remember the 300L does not. It has a paper filter. Um, so the oiled filter is it, it's foam and it's reusable. So you take it out, clean it with. It's kind of like a chain actually. Clean it yeah. with air filter cleaner. Um, squeeze all it out, rinse it off really good, and then you spray it down with oil. And then you put it back in and the oil along with the foam catches all the debris so that it's easier to clean and the oil makes it stickier. So it'll, it'll clean the air better, but also catch more stuff. So it'll get dirtier faster. Right. And then there's a the hybrid option, which, cause I bought that 790 adventure, which has a paper filter, which is notoriously crappy at letting dirt in and getting your valves all screwed up. So I bought a power plate, which is a pre-filter, which is an oiled pre-filter that replaces the airbox lid. So I'm getting double the filtering power. Um, yeah. yeah, but they're all easy to replace. Yeah. Unless um, they're hard to get to, but they're all easy to replace. Yes. I mean, that's the thing. It's just sometimes it's a little more difficult than you want it to be. But 
again, like we mentioned earlier, just don't ever tighten anything too much because you never know when you're going to need to do a quick little maintenance swap. Uh, also, still can't believe you bought a KTM, but we'll talk about that later. Anyway. Well, I bought it for reasons. Uh, <laughs> some are some are as easy as, like on my DRZ, it even had thumb screws on the panel. So it was just, I didn't even need a tool. Yeah. Just pop, 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 pull the panel off. I did need a screwdriver for the side of the airbox. Four screws on the airbox, and you slide the filter out, clean it, replace it, or just replace it if it's a paper filter. Um, a lot of bigger bikes, it's sometimes right under the seat. That's yeah. super easy. Uh, on a dirt bike or a dual sport, though, it's generally accessible from the side and generally kind of under the seat because that's really the only place to put an airbox. Yeah, that's where mine is for the 250X, and it's a piece of cake to get. To. I mean, a little maneuvering, but it's super easy to get to. That's how most dual sport and dirt bikes are, though. Yeah, so in general, you really only need a screwdriver and maybe some sockets, depending on what's holding. Holding? Yeah. Wow. Holding the fasteners, the fairings on the side of your bike. Now, it gets more complicated. Honestly, the more you spend on your bike, the more complicated it seems to get. Although not the 790, it's right under the seat. It's super easy, so it just depends on the bike design. It has other problems, so. <laughs> this will be fun. This will be fun. But All anyway, right. um, they'll charge you a ton for that. Just like when yeah. you go to get your oil changed and they're like, do you want to put a new air filter in? It's $75. And it's like, yeah, I could do that in literally two minutes at home and buy a filter for 15 So no. Um, same kind of thing. Same kind of thing. And again, this is one of those things where if you're a little nervous about it, pull up a YouTube video. Seriously. It's yeah, just it's one of the do. most amazing parts about YouTube nowadays. It's just you can figure out how to do anything. Yep. And if you're on a particularly dusty or long ride, sometimes you have to do it in the field. So it's important yeah. to know how to do it. Sometimes Absolutely. you sk- you carry a spare filter or a pre-filter, like a filter skin that goes on the outside that you just peel off because it's oiled yep. too and keep riding. Yep. Um, so lots of advantages there. Uh, Absolutely. Another easy maintenance task that you should be familiar with because it crops up often enough. Um, it's kind of this is like a list of things that I would I would also... Um, side note, be prepared to deal with maybe in the field because it's all easy things that are common issues that you should, if you can diagnose and fix yourself, you can get out of there. But um, battery stuff. Yeah. Like checking your battery voltage is easy if you have the right tool. And honestly, a multimeter is fun to play with once you learn it. But simple enough that if that's all you need to do, you literally just turn it on, hit the 12 volt button and touch it. And it'll tell you if you got less than 12 volts, you're in trouble. Um, More is good. Um, But even swapping batteries is easy enough. Yeah. Yeah. I've never swapped a battery, but I have watched it be done many a times. It does not seem like it is too big of a task. And again, YouTube all the way. Um, yeah. I also, uh, I know Ben mentioned this when we were getting ready for the podcast, but um, a lot of people are scared of batteries and I don't think they need to be. I think it's something that seems a lot scarier than it actually is because everyone always thinks, oh, I'm going to touch it and die. And that is not mm-hmm. how batteries work. <laughs> No, you can't hurt yourself with a 12 volt battery. And I mean, no. if you put a wrench across both terminals, you might be in trouble. Ouch. But you can touch both. Yeah. Um, and the other thing is, I always worry about blowing up something on my bike, but everything is fused. And then, even if it isn't, I have a great story about how I got stranded on my Africa Twin one time, thanks to a really cool local mechanic shop. But even if it isn't, they put the wrong thing and they put a relay in where there was supposed to be a fuse. There's a main fuse on your bike that will pop and keep you from damaging anything, which is how yeah. I ended up stranded because it the one pop did the one fuse didn't pop, but the main fuse did, and I had nothing versus just not having dash panel right. Um, yeah. So. It's hard to permanently damage something messing with electrical. If you're not sure, you know, you can always, I bought an electrical tester that you like just put it next to wires and it turns red. That thing has right. eliminated my fear of working on electrical, even here on the house. That thing is yeah. awesome. Yeah. But you might, everybody ends up with a dead battery sometimes, especially if your bike sits all, all winter, you know, and you don't have it on a battery tender or whatever. You, at some point you're going to have to get in there. It's not really harder than an air filter swap in most cases. Also, keep your bike on a battery tender. Seriously. It just makes life so much easier, especially during the winter. Like I have one of those dirt bikes. Ben has watched me struggle with it so many times because she hates cold weather, but what does help is keeping it on there all winter. Cause then all I need to do is let the bikes sit in the sun for a bit and I can usually get it kickstarted, but it does make a huge difference. I have mine always on them in the garage. It just, it helps. It helps immensely. Yeah. So to, cl- to clarify, if you don't know what a battery tender does, so a, a battery sit- that sits for too long will discharge slowly, and if it gets below a certain point, then um, it loses capacity and eventually fails 
I've had that yeah. happen a couple of times with, within the, like if you have a bike with a parasitic draw, you know, within a year I've had a battery fail that I didn't have on a tender. So a tender yeah. is either just two clamps that you put on the battery terminals or even easier, you bolt, you attach just a lead, like a SAE lead that you can then just plug in without taking anything off the bike. I have those on all of my bikes and it just so, trickle charges and keeps the battery topped up when you're not riding. Yep. It's so, so nice to have super convenient and literally takes no time whatsoever to just kind of go in, check it, see how the battery is doing and, and call it a day. Yeah. It has a comforting green light that makes you feel like I'm good. I'm taking care of my bike. Green means go. Yeah. It means you're ready to ride. Mm-hmm. So yeah, batteries, that's one that people can do. Another one that people can do that it, this will be controversial. Um, and honestly, it's maybe a, it's not the, the super easy, you know, close your eyes and ride a bike. I don't know what metaphor I'm going for here. It's not as easy as the other things we've talked about, but it's it's more important, I think, that you know how to do it, and it's worth the effort it takes to learn this a little bit more difficult task, and that is tire swaps. Yep. Because, one, it just saves you money, and it maybe more yeah. so. So some of you are going to be lucky. Some of you ride bikes with tubeless tires, and you'll never have to take a tire off. Good for you. Yeah. Um, but... Even a tubeless tire can fail if you get a slash in the sidewall and your solution is you have to be able to get a tube in there yeah. to get out. So this is a skill that's important to know. Yeah, it is. I've never had to change the tires on my bike ever, but I have been a part of many tire changes out in the middle of nowhere. It's just a good thing to know how to do. Um, usually one of the best parts about it too, is you're not usually alone when you have to do it. So you have a couple of people that can help assist, but if you are going to learn how to do it in the garage, uh, just so for your own time, again, it's a nice money saver. It's a great skill set to have, and you become everybody's best friend in your riding group very quickly. Yeah. And like it's the tire flats are so random. Like I rode for, for four or five years no flats or one flat and then we got three in 12 hours in mexico two yep. on the same day in the dark and then we were leaving the parking lot after we swapped because we put front tubes in the rear tire so we, we spent an extra hour in the morning in ensenada or actually ensenada it's not an NA, um swapping that and then as we're pulling out of the parking we're like okay it's time to go tyler's flat front tire was flat and we had to do it again like it just yep. happens so um it's you can in the first time i did a tire swap it sucked. Like I, yeah. it, that was a that was a half rack of beer operation, and and I mean that time wise and also just like tolerance wise. But uh, it, it was yeah. hard. It's a skill that you get better at the more you do it. I it, yeah. and and it's two things, two separate things. Taking the wheels off, which yeah. I just did yesterday, and oh my god, I'm so much faster than I used to be. And that's practice. It's the only practice. way to get there. And two, it's swapping the actual tire. Um, which yeah. involves a lot of spooning and, and grunting and cussing. Yeah. Oh, absolutely. Um, there's at least five to seven F bombs, no matter how easy it is, I feel like. But yeah, I think that is the, the best thing to note is just that most flat tires happen when you least expect it. And it is kind of a snowball effect. I think anytime I've dealt with flats, it's either like nobody gets one or everybody gets one or multiple. And that's just kind of how it goes. So if you are in those situations, you get very good at it very quickly. But again, practice makes perfect with any of this stuff. The more you do it, the better you get. Yeah, this is a weird skill like that because there yeah. are, like, if you watch the Rabaconda videos, people are swapping tires in three minutes. Um, yeah. I was in Mexico with a guy that was a six days rider. And part of their end of the day routine every day while they were out racing was they had to swap their tires. And they only had 15 minutes to do it by themselves. No one's allowed to help you. So, like, he was, it was really great to have that guy because he was super oh, yeah. fast. But like, but my first swap, I think it took two hours. Yeah. And oh, yeah. and now I can, you know, I can do it in half an hour, 45 minutes, depending on how much trouble I have. But um, yeah. it, so it's one of those skills where really, unfortunately, there's no substitute for practicing it. And the only way to practice it is to do it, you know, put your own tires on. And then you have that extra familiarity with your bike. You know what tools you need. That's the other thing is every bike is different. And so yeah. like the, the KLX, for instance, has Allen key pinch bolts. I've never seen that before. So I got to make sure I have that Allen key in my tire change kit or else I'm not getting that axle out. Right. right exactly. Silly stuff like that. So, you know, you know what your bike needs, you know how to do it on your own bike and you know how to deal with the problem when you get out there, whether you have tubes or not more yeah. important on a dual sport, in my opinion, um, just because yeah. you're more likely to have to do it in it yeah. on a, on a, or sorry, a bike with tubeless tires, a tubed tires, because tubeless Tube. tires, 90% of the time you're going to get to, you hopefully just patch it and go. 
plug yeah. it and go. Which, you know, is one of the big benefits of having tubeless tires. And I don't have tubeless on the Transalp right now. I had them on the CB and it was so nice. I never got flat and I loved it. Um, cause, and the nice thing is like knowing how to patch a tire quickly is great. Like I do have that knowledge of like, and so it's nice. It's just very comforting of like, cool. If I get a flat, I'll just patch it and get somewhere and make sure there's not another hole. But like, it's just, uh, it, it also just is tire preference too. With dirt bike or dual sport, you're going to have tubes no matter what. So it's good yeah. skill set. Yeah, and like roadside assistance exists, true, yeah. but it doesn't, they won't come off the pavement in most cases, no. or at least not off a major road. So you got to get, and sometimes you don't have cell phone service to call them anyway. So you got to get out, you yeah. got to get down. And, yep. and also, even if you do have roadside assistance, it'll take them two hours to get there. Easier oh, yeah. to spend half an hour swapping a tube. Which again goes back to one of our previous podcast episodes where we talked about things to carry with you when you're on the road, which includes mm-hmm. water, electrolytes, snacks, etc. And sometimes beer. Kit. Yes. I will literally, like, I have one that just goes from bike to bike. And even if I'm just going out to dink around 20 minutes from here, I always throw that tire changing kit on. Yeah. Yeah. It's oh. worth it. It's well yeah. worth it, everybody. So that's worth investing time into, even though it's hard. Yeah. And on that note, what else can you do to your bike that's a basic mod to make it a little bit easier to maintain, Ben? And or l- things that you will learn how to do and get a better familiarity with your bike, right? Like, yeah. So, uh, well, yeah. So that's really it's two questions, bro. That's two questions, bro. Yeah. Center stand is like a game changer in terms of maintenance, but it's not practical for everyone. So, no. You know, in the field, sometimes you have to find a rock or a log to prop it up on, or just tip it over and work on it on the side. That's the thing that happens. Yeah. But anyone, I think, can do a lot of basic mods to their bike too, and that was a lot of how I learned and gained confidence in wrenching was adding mods like hand guards and, and putting your own skid plate on and you know yeah. slopping the seat and that you can do a slip on exhaust pretty easily it's not as intimidating as you think it is crash bars yeah. whatever that's all stuff that you can even do basic wiring like heated grips and usb chargers because in general they just require running a, a wire back to the battery or tapping in general in but did you not just have a fight with some heated hand grips that you were putting on a bike i don't want to Maybe? talk about okay what, heated, what are you talking about which bike I, I don't think it was your bike. I think it was, was it oh. Sean's bike? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 Oh my God. That's because. <laughs> yeah. I don't so use grip again, I don't use grip For the most part, it can be easy, but not on every bike, just like everything right. we've been talking about. But that's about, how right? you learn, you know, and it's like nothing is insurmountable. Yeah. Um, that's like what I learned with, with both like, I want to say carpentry, but I'm not a carpenter, but just like, you know, yeah. things, will, mistakes will happen. Things will get messed up. You'll lose a, a, a fastener, right? You put a zip yeah. tie in there and keep going. It doesn't matter. Like no bike is perfect. And every time I work on a bike, it's a little less imperfect, a little less yeah. perfect. But the point is functionality, right? And yeah. And as long as you can cover up your mistake and, and there's nothing that is irreplaceable. Like if you destroy a fairing, you buy a new one. It, you know, yeah. I kicked off that turn signal on my 300 L and had to buy a new fairing and it was $9, but it, you know, an hour to get to it is stupid. Well, and I think that's the big thing. And I know most off-road riders at any capacity know this. You don't have that bike in the garage for it to look good and be perfect. You have that bike in the garage because it's a tool for you to have a good time. That's it. And, you know, if that means you have to break a couple of things and have some cosmetic damage, then that means you break some things and have some cosmetic damage. That's it. Who cares? Go have fun. Go ride. That's all that matters. Yeah. And that attitude changes as you get more experienced and like, yeah. <laughs> here's an example. I bought that 790, and then my first ride on it, literally 20 miles on the bike, I low sided it. And yeah. uh, it, I would have been mad a few years ago, but I was just yeah. like, I was going to low side it eventually, you know, whatever. Yeah. And it yeah. actually took it really well. There's very little visible. It's just not even, the fairings aren't even scratched. But yeah. um, but I was just, I wasn't even mad. I was just like, wish I had the protection on it that I've ordered, but it was fine. So it is what it is. It's you the bikes are years. It's a yeah. breaking process. Uh, yeah. It's a tool. It's not it's not a display item. No. It's a tool. Yeah. Agreed. Just like me. I'm a tool, not a display oh. item. Yeah, we're both tools. Grace, what are the benefits of doing your own maintenance? Saving money is probably one of the big ones. Um because again, like we were talking about, cost of labor right now, very expensive. And cost of everything if you take it into a dealership or shop is just tightened 
everything is heightened unless you're doing it on your own. So that is number one. Uh, another one, you get to know your bike better. You get to know where everything is on your bike so that when things do go wrong, you know where to look, which can help when you're in the middle of nowhere and don't have cell phone reception. Absolutely. What else, Ben? What do you got? Well, if you're doing your own mods, you know, you get the opportunity to customize your bike to to the way you like it you know you had bar risers because you like it a little taller you put grips on that you like and you also when you're like ooh, oh, i don't like these bar risers you know to take them back off and you're not paying someone to do both right so you can yep. you can make it suit you and tweak and get a better idea of what you like i think that's worth it and you know depending on your level of skill there is a there's a level of peace of mind that comes with having done the maintenance yourself knowing that the bolts are tightened you know the eyes are dotted the t's are crossed the right. maintenance was done recently and that's not to say that dealerships are bad um you know in general the, the people there know what they're doing but some people really get paranoid and or just don't trust other people to work on their bikes yeah and so at least you don't have to wonder you know as you're flying through the air you know are my foot pegs securely attached because you know that they yeah. are because you did it yourself yeah um, exactly and, and we already covered this but it's worth reiterating doing these things means that when you have to do them doing them when you can or don't have to means that when you do have to because particularly for us off-road riders we are in far-flung places and stuff goes sideways yeah. it happens um knowing having some idea where to start what to look at how to change a tire uh i can remember one time at, the first time i took Lil dork out on the 250l she dropped it like three times and um, her throttle was sticking because she she bent the handguard so bad and i was out there and i just banged it back into place with a rock because i knew what it was i put it on myself i knew th th that was all there was to do you know and that, yeah. those things are super helpful yeah um so i think it's you will run into a situation where you're going to wish you knew more about your bike than you do always and Even i think if, that there's there's always stuff to learn about what the bike is capable of what you're capable of too um and all of that helps you know obviously mentioned that I have a friend of mine who's a mechanic who helps me with all my bike stuff, but I will say I'm there watching him do it the entire time so that I know how things look on the bike. So that if I'm ever in a situation where I know I need to adjust something or move something out or bang a throttle back into place, I know how to do it. And there is something that is very giving with peace of mind with that is just once you kind of understand your bike and how things function, you're never going to be in a situation where you're panicking if something is wrong. Yeah, and we want you to be safe out there. We want yes, you to have fun. We want you to enjoy riding. But um, if it's slightly less fun and you're safe, then I feel better about that. So Agreed. Agreed. a little bit of time invested in the garage is going to pay dividends out in the field. And I think, I think it's worth reiterating that that really we're coming at this not from the perspective of someone who's been doing motorcycle mechanics their whole life or what or someone that grew up working on go-karts and stuff that's like what are you stupid it's easy to swap a transmission um no it is actually no. difficult i mean motorcycles <laughs> you know, to swap a transition i did i got into the clutch place one time that's probably as involved in the internals of an engine i've ever been yeah. um but these we aren't those people like these are things no. that li literally anybody can do and i just want to encourage you to consider attempting them if you feel comfortable. And yeah. if you don't feel comfortable, there are ways to get more comfortable, like? YouTube. YouTube is your friend. Go watch a video. Watch it five times. Watch it 20 times. Whatever you need to do to get yourself familiar with how things look. And then, then give it a try. Just make still, sure you have the right tools. Still to this day, I will pull up a Rocky Mountain installation video. Do this. Watch a step. Do Pause it. Do the step. Watch yeah. a step pause it do the step yeah also, just... most of the time your mechanics are also doing the same thing i mean i've been in so many shop situations <laughs> where i've been sitting there with the guy and he's like all right well let's just go figure out how to do this and he and i will both sit down on their computer and watch a video and then we both try and remember and go in and add a crash bar that's random or fix something you know that's on a fairing whatever else like it's just that is something that happens all the time. Don't think they know everything. They are not encyclopedias. That is not yep. how it works. Yep. Yeah. And Grace touched on this one already, but mechanically inclined friends will often work for beverages in conversation. And, you know, you probably hopefully have riding buddies and a lot of them will have been in the same place or they work on their own bikes. But even if you don't, 
again, this community always blows my mind. I have seen people post questions in like the PNW writers group and then be like, yeah. hey, um, just can I get some advice on how to do simple tasks? And somebody will be like, wait, are you in Seattle too? you will be like, yeah. He's like, oh, I'll come by and help you yeah. out with it. Like randos, yeah. there are people that enjoy this shit. Take advantage of them. I'm not yeah. one of them, but there no. are people that actively enjoy it. These are mainly the people that have grown up doing it. And for so for them, it feels second nature. And most people in general, like if you're super knowledgeable about knowledgeable about something, you want to offer that knowledge to somebody else. And so mm -hmm. having a friend or two friends or six friends that you can kind of give a quick call to and say, hey, I've got whiskey that I just picked up. I need some help with a tire change tonight. Can you come coach me through it? Cool. Some pepperoni just, pizza sitting right there, here. There we go. You know, just... Yeah. Make it an incentive. Obviously, it's a give and take thing. You don't want to make anybody feel taken advantage of, but your friends want to help you. And, and honestly, most motorcycle riders just want to help other people for yeah, the most yeah. part. Yeah. And a great place to get that kind of advice if you don't have local people is forums and Facebook groups. So, yep. Thumper Talk, ADV Rider. There's a okay. Facebook group for every. Like, the first thing I do when I get a bike is I join all the Facebook groups related to it because that's where I get all my information about common issues and right. mods. So you can always ask for advice in those places. Um, yep. And my final tip to you is keep records. Uh, yep. One, just for warranty purposes, like we discussed. But two, especially when you're juggling multiple bikes, I know poor me, um, it's sometimes easy to forget when you did that last oil change. Uh, now, I typically film them, so I, or at least take a picture, so I can go back on Instagram and be like, oh, right. I did that, whatever. But keeping records of that kind of thing or... My favorite tip or the thing I was doing on the 450L is my trip B. So if you have two trip odometers, I would just reset trip B every time I did an oil change so yeah. that I knew when it hit a thousand miles, which is I was pushing it a little far on the 450L, I was going to do another one. You can do right. that on your other, but I'm telling you these bikes, unless you ride all the time, which people yeah. do, some people put 30,000 miles on their bike a year. Great. Keep it, pay attention to it. The average rider rides less than 2000 miles a year. So, yes. um, if you just sort of know that you're not going to hit the limit or greatly exceed it, just like I change my oil every June, essentially, <laughs> in all the bikes I have, because I know that yeah. that was the last time I did it. Yeah. But keep record, put nice. on the calendar. Yeah. Just keep track of everything. It's such a good, a good habit to get into for everything with your bike, whether it's tires, oil, air filter, everything. Just having a nice general gauge of where everything is at will help because then if things do go wrong, you kind of have an idea of like, oh, well, I'm probably due for oil. Or, you know, I did do that really dusty ride where Ben was just like spraying everything in my face the whole time, you know, like things like that, where like you just, if you keep track of it, it's going to make maintenance a lot easier. Just don't follow me so closely. I don't know what your problem I know. is. I'm sorry. What can I yeah. say? You're just, you're just anyway. faster than me. You just pass me. I know. Yeah. so much faster than you that's true. so much faster all right grace any any last minute what have we forgotten any any easy tasks that people can do any advice or recommendations for people that are maybe afraid to give it a shot just give it a shot you know if you screw something up just make sure you map it in your head put everything back on but again like worst case scenario is you kind of screw something up and you have to take it into a shop and have somebody look at it if that's right. the worst case scenario you know, you're never going to figure out this stuff unless you try it on your own. So just get the YouTube video out, watch it a couple of times. And worst case scenario is you're messaging me or Ben or an assortment of people who are motorcycle riders on Instagram, YouTube, whatever else asking questions. Don't, don't message me for mechanical advice. It will not go well for anyone. <laughs> That's not don't a message good me either. I'll put you in touch with people though, yeah. but I don't know anything. <laughs> yeah. Uh, it's like, I love you, but there's no point in messaging me because I don't know a damn thing. Uh, take pictures as you go if you're worried. Find a YouTube video that's of Great. people doing the exact. Because sometimes you're like, where does this bolt go? Yeah. Um, but if you can find a video or you have a picture, you're like, ah, oh, here. Or, and or, when you take a bolt out, put it back in the same spot once you've removed whatever was holding it so that you know where it goes. I do that sometimes. But anyway, yeah. pro tips. Um, that's a whole nother topic. But God, Grace. These are moron say, tips, though. Not pro tips. Yeah. Moron yeah. tips. Moron yeah. tips. I got to say, it's so great to have you back in America. <sighs> great to be back it's nice to have a nice little tan especially going into this weekend because i believe it's going to be in the mid to high 60s and sunny in oregon this weekend which sounds absolutely fantastic to yeah. me that means we get to get out and ride it's going up 10 degrees a day today the high was 50 tomorrow 60 and saturday 70 i'm so stoked i'm actually going to get on ride dirt bikes tomorrow with my friend michaela and oh, i'm very excited I about guess it. my invite was lost in the mail it's not a big deal 
you can drive over and hang out with me whenever you want and you know it yeah i know mm-hmm. i don't want to okay well uh <laughs> thank you as always grace if people want to interact you interact you interact with you and find you not just here on the podcast that hopefully you're already following or subscribed to where can yes. they find you um, I am actually on Instagram and YouTube under the Graceful Renegade. You can find me there. I will say that starting Friday for about three and a half weeks, I will be off social media. And this is, I know, very terrifying for a lot of people. But the reason why is actually because I'm doing a new documentary project about uh, becoming a digital minimalist. It is a very cool new thing that's coming around for a lot of people that are dealing with social media, being kind of an addiction issue. And so I'll be a part of a big film project kind of um, demonstrating what we can do to find better uh, writing balance and social media balance. So so for the next three weeks, it'll just be me on the podcast because yes. Grace is becoming Amish. However, you can email me through my website, which is www.thegracefulrenegade.com. We'd love to hear from you. But yeah, otherwise, I'll be on hiatus for three weeks. But then, where can everybody reach out to you to ask where I am? I was kidding about doing the podcast by myself. I think she's still doing the podcast. <laughs> yes, of um, course. I, I, am the, I am Dork in the Road on YouTube, a Dork in the Road on Instagram, Dork in the Road on TikTok, and I don't know, in, in my basement. Yes. Just look for Dork in the Road. Sometimes it's a Dork in the Road. Otherwise, it's Dork in the Road. Yeah, if you and... walk into your basement and there's a Dork, um, mm-hmm. it's not me because I'm a Dork in the Road. But that yes. is a Dork in your basement. Very specific. Yeah. Well, thank you, everybody. We love you. Have a great weekend. I hope if you're in Oregon or the Pacific Northwest, you get out and ride and enjoy the sunshine. If not, keep surviving winter, everybody. And don't forget to live wild, ride free. And please do not forget to be ex- That sounds sarcastic. Hold on. Let me start over. <laughs> Please don't forget. Please do not forget to be excellent to each other. Bye. Oh, thank you.